Hey all, welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I'm Darren, I'm your host, and today I'm bringing back a couple friends of mine, Lloyd Capuccio and Kevin Liddell. We're going to talk about steak, all different kinds of steak, where it comes from, cuts, grades, and all that. We're going to talk about it. I'll be right back with Lloyd and Kevin. Smoking, grilling, getting hot and hotter, sous vide and chilling from Fire and water. Hey all, it has got a few new great products this year and one of them is their brand new vacuum sealer. It has a very compact design but has all the functions that you would need. It has a dry and moist option plus a seal and vacuum seal button and a stop button plus a built-in bag cutter. It's small enough to fit in your drawer or take with you on vacation. So it also has an accessory attachment for any containers that use any other vacuum sealer uh, brand containers. Check it out guys, it's like $60 right now on Amazon, so it's also very affordable. And it's an Inkbird, so I know it's a good product. So check it out in the link below. Check out Inkbird products and uh, back to the show. Welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I am Darren. I am your host. And today I've got another great guest that's been on before, Lloyd Capuccio. He is also known as the Kosher Dosher. Today we're going to discuss steaks. And um, we want to dive you know, pretty deep into steaks. It's not, uh, it's not a, a topic that is um, you know, very limited. There's a lot of stuff we can talk about. So Lloyd, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Darren. Thanks for having me. Where are you from again, Lloyd? So people who know who you uh, are. I live in Seattle, Washington, and don't hold that against me, please. But I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. And you are the Kosher Dosher. You have the Kosher Dosher blog. You're I on do. many, many of the Facebook groups dealing with sous vide and other cooking. You love to do experiments. So make oh, yes. sure you check out the Kosher Dosher, D O S H E R, the Kosher Dosher. That's correct. And we're going to talk about, like I said, steaks. I want to go into this because you see a lot of people, um, especially when you try to talk to people who don't know anything about sous vide or they know very little, all they think about is steak and how it can cook a steak or what they heard it can cook a steak. But steak seems to be a popular topic even outside of sous vide. Um, I know that, um, you know, Guga, you know who Guga is from uh, sous vide everything and Guga eats. He does, like, I would say, three out of every five videos he does is steak. So it seems to be, he gets a lot of views. It seems to be very popular. People are always asking questions about how to, you know, cook steaks and, and what proper temps and times and all different kinds of stuff on the Facebook group. So I thought we would dive a little bit deeper into steaks as a topic today. So let's talk about all the different, you know, I want to talk about all the, all the different cuts, all the different grades and all that. So Let's start out about, um, you know, let's, let's, let's go into just the different grades of beef. If you go to your local grocery store or your butcher shop, there's three different kinds of grades that you normally see, but there's a lot more. If you look into it deeper, there are actually more um, grades than, than what are there. Normally what you see in your grocery store is choice. That's probably the most popular that people see. Prime is another, it's more of a top line. You'll see that uh, restaurants advertise that they use Prime as their um, grade of uh, what they normally sell. Even though it's a grading system that they have certain guidelines that they use, it's still subjective from uh, right. from inspector to inspector because of the way the, the grading system works. And it's only graded on one part of the cow, which is the ribeye the section. Rib- ribeye. So the, you know they grade, they grade the whole cow subjected on one piece of you know one part of the cow and with that and here's what I've always heard is that with that grading system you know graded prime you're going to get more for that particular steer than you are if it was choice or select um, and so they they actually have to pay to have these graded they're not something that the usda does for free i mean they actually charge them to have these graded so a lot of these farmers know that they have prime beef but 
they don't want to have to pay the USDA to have somebody come in. And what if he decides he's going to grade that one choice and they're still paying for it, you know, yeah. and they can't, they can't get as much for, for that steer. So, I mean, that's the whole thing with, with, from when I talked to um, uh, the guys at Porter road is that they know that the steers that they're buying from these farms are top choice, yes, top quality. And there's no way that they're going to pay extra to have it graded by somebody who may come in and, you know, half of the ones they're going to grade as choice and half of them as prime. So they lose money on, on some of the other ones. So they just all the money. Decide, yeah. Decide not to do it. There's another one that I know I buy some, occasionally I'll buy some meat. They call it no roll and they say no roll because they're when they stamp it with the prime or choice or select, they roll the, you know, the, the stamp. So they say no roll because there's no stamp mark on it from the, there's no grade at all. Yeah. There's no grade, but that doesn't mean like we were just talking about, doesn't mean it's not good. It just means that they didn't have it graded. So you could buy, you know, no roll, um, you know, beef and it'd still be excellent. Oh, I've come across prime. Let's Good. see, Kevin's, Kevin's trying to join in. Let's see if he can awesome. get him to come in. See if he works. I hope so. I've come across uh, uh, strip steak New York's that are labeled prime. I'm like, that's not prime. That looks like crap. And I've complained to the butcher. They go, well, it's the grading system. Technically, it's prime, although what it looks like is choice. And I've come across some other choice cuts. I ran across some tri-tip at uh, Safeway. No, I'm sorry. It was, it was Fred Meyer. I'm looking in the showcase. I'm like, that's prime. That is prime tri-tip, but nobody knows it. And I bought 10 packages. This is before yeah. COVID. Yeah. And I see that all the time on the Facebook groups. People will post something up and it'll have really good marbling and they'll say, look, this is labeled as select. And it's, you know, Oof. you can tell that it's not. Kevin, are you there? Can you hear it? Yay! All right. Kevin's in. Kevin's in the house. All right. Yeah, and I gotta fix my audio issues. We can't see your pretty face. All right. Well, you fix your audio and we're gonna continue to talk and uh All right. so yeah, I've seen it to where um you like I said, and it goes back to because the grading is done on just one part of the cow, you know, to me it could be, you know, perfect somewhere mm -hmm. it could look like prime on the ribeye and then you go to the you know the, the top sirloin section and uh, you know, it looked totally different and vice versa so yeah I, I, you know it's, uh, that's why i'm really not really big on the grading system yeah i'm here all right uh, awesome okay so what do you think about oh, that the grading? Hard. what do you think about the grading system kevin we're, we're talking about the uh, usda grading system um, and how it uh, can affect the the farmers and, and ranchers, and they have to pay extra for it and all that. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it definitely is beneficial if you're a big producer to pay the extra to have USDA inspectors. Uh, I think now it's it's a relative it, it's a flawed system. It's it's taken they grade it from the twelfth rib of the ribeye, and that's all they look at, and that's how it's graded. Uh, and they grade that, they use uh, the intermuscular fat content and what they believe to be the yield of the animal as far as red meat goes. Uh, and that what they do now, it used to be all done by eyeball. Now they actually use cameras that send a, vit, a photo to a, a computer that analyzes the pictures and it actually, oh, wow. grades the, it, grade, it actually grades the animal automatically. Now the USDA inspectors, if they don't agree with the computer's evaluation of the quality of the meat they can override that system but generally they don't have to yeah yeah and, and like we were discussing that um a lot of the online sources like um crowd cow and porter road most of the farmers that they buy from don't have their meat graded because they have to pay extra for it and they can actually lose money because if they they have a prime cow and they, that particular part that they're grading doesn't look right that whole cow is now they've lost money on it so um it's Plus, uh it's ungodly expensive yeah it's really expensive so if you're not a, if you're not a big player you know you can't you can't afford it right yeah i'm actually buying a cow it'll be done this coming week um i think i'll have it in my freezer but 
I, you know, I know the guy who raised it and I know that the, the, the steers that he used and I bought from him before. So I know it's going to be a really top quality um, beef, but he's, he doesn't pay to get it graded. So he doesn't need to, because he doesn't sell, like you said, he's not selling to high end restaurants or, you know, uh, supermarkets where he can actually get more money for it, you know, for a volume because of its uh, rating. So, so let's talk about since the grading system is kind of subjective and, you know, you'll find it, you know, like me and me and Lloyd were talking about how he'll find something that's labeled as choice or even select in the store. And it looks like it's prime because of the marbling in it, which is what they go by. What about the breed? Yeah, I, was just, go ahead. I was just about to bring that up. <laughs> I was just about to say the same thing, but Lloyd beat me to it because I was late to the party. But yeah. yeah, many times I, I found a nice, you know, Delmonico and I'm like, this is, op this would have been, this should be prime and it's choice and I'm paying choice. I mean, I'm happy, but I'm sure the guy who sold the steer isn't happy. Yeah. And that's the thing. And that's why when I've had the, the CEO for, from uh, Porter Road on, you know, that's one of the things he said that the people, the farms that they buy from, that's where it's the catch 22, you know, it's great when that cows, uh, that steer is, you know, graded as prime because the whole the whole steer is graded as prime so they can sell that whole thing at top dollar. But what if you got a, you know, one that 90% of it looks like it's prime, but that one part that they took a picture of is, you know, they graded as a, as a choice or a select and now you've lost so much money on that steer. So <clears throat> when you're talking, you know, hundreds of pounds of beef on, in one steer, I mean, that's a lot of money to lose. So let's talk about the breeds of beef because one of the things I think, especially nowadays, people don't understand that like Wagyu is not a, uh, a grade of beef. It's a actual breed, breed. <laughs> and it's actually, well, Wagyu actually means, well, Wagyu actually, I think it means a Japanese cow. Right. I think it means. Yes. Yep. And then people will think of that as a grade or, and then also, you know, they, they get confused even more because there's American companies out there using Wagyu that, it might be 10%, you know, Wagyu in it. And that's a Wagyu crossed with, you know, different other breeds of cow, but there's no really um, system that monitors how they use the term Wagyu. <laughs> so, uh, I think, well, I did read though on the U S government website and in order to, for them to label something Wagyu, the breed's got to be at least 50%, but I don't think there's any checks or balances as to, I don't think is they can the, get fined or anything for no, it. Maybe uh, no. maybe something with the FTC with truth and labeling, but you know, yeah. that's the whole thing. I mean, I see people all the time that will post up in the, look, I got some Wagyu and like, and they're thinking it's, you know, Japanese A5, but you know, no. it's like, no buddy, that's, no. that's not the that's, experience. That's that choice. Yeah. That's choice. <clears throat> right. It's the equivalent of calling California sparkling wine champagne. Right. So and I've had, uh, I've had some good domestic Wagyu that was, um, you know, and some of it, you know, there's some that it's actually a hundred percent Wagyu breed in the, they're, they're raised in uh, Texas or, you know, Washington state, even there's some that they're not cross, but they're still not the a five. They're still not the, the things that are coming out of Japan. They are a little bit better than the, the, the ones that are crossed with Angus or, or other different breeds, but, um, it uh, there's uh, it's it's still not the stuff that you get from Australia or um, Jap you know Japan that's uh, the pure A5 A4 Japanese wagyu. Well, just my opinion. I've had a lot of uh, wagyu A5 from Crowd Cow, you know, um, amazing. But I gotta tell you, my preference is the crossbreeds between Black Angus and wagyu mixed together. I prefer the uh, taste of the meat yeah, over the A5. I've, I've had, I've actually had the A5 and I've had the olive Wagyu, which is the, mm -hmm. you know, one that's where they only eat, you know, the husks of olive, you know, the olives, yeah, there, yeah. Can, which is supposed to be super, super rare, but I, I'm, I'm kind of with you. It's too rich. It's, it's, yes. it's, got, it's got awful expensive for one. You can't eat that every day and you can't even eat it once a month because it's so expensive, but it's so rich that, you know, and it melts in your mouth and it's not, you know, I don't know. It's something different you got to try, but it's not something that you really want to try very often and, and eat, you know, very often at all. But um, the, the, the way I would describe it, I'm sorry, go ahead, Kevin. 
Well, a 12 ounce steak is for three people. You know, we're used to eating a 12 ounce steak on our own, but when you have a five, uh, you know, that real rich stuff, 36. three or four ounces is about as much as you want to eat. Yeah. And it's, it's, like I said, it's kind of like, you know, eating, I don't know. It's, it's just super rich. It's, not, it, it's like foie or, you know, caviar or something. It's something you don't want to have a whole lot of because it's, uh, you know, it's just, it's overpowering. It's really super rich and it, it's expensive on top of that. But I've had some, you know, the hundred percent, you know, Wagyu from raised in Texas, that's actually pretty darn good. And I've had some of the cross that is pretty good too. Now, you know, I've had it that I thought was better than, than regular prime, you know, some of that you're still paying a premium for, but you're not paying that a five or a four, you know, premium. You're, you're paying maybe, you know, 20% more than you would for prime or something like that, which I, I see that I can, I can, I can do that. I can eat a whole New York strip of that cross egg you and, and yes. feel good about it. And, um, and, and I, I kind of give this analogy when I, uh, when I'm eating like olive Wagyu or an A5 Wagyu from Crowd Cow, it's like, you know, you're eating beef, but you're not eating beef. Right. Maybe it's the American in me. I'm like, this is good. It's rich and it's beef, but it's not beef. So yeah. it's good, but it's kind of like, I like the Wagyu crossbreed with Black Angus is my favorite. Yeah, exactly. So. A lot of that, since it is a crossbreed, they don't, that's not really graded. You won't see that graded either. No, you will not. And um, I don't know why that is. Um, go ahead, Kevin. I think one of the reasons they probably don't get that stuff graded is because they're not going to exceed a uh, grading of prime. Right. And you figure if you're using that type of cattle, you're, you're going to get at least prime out of it. I mean, I doubt they get too many selects or canners out of them. Um, so, you know, why bother paying when you know you've got the label, you've got the term Wagyu in there, and there's a certain expectation that it's going to be prime or above. But as a domestic producer, you're never going to get above prime. So, how, you know, how do you promote it? So why bother? Yeah, I can understand that. Definitely. If you can stick prime on it or Wagyu on it, there's no reason to have prime on there as well and pay the extra money to have it graded. That's for sure. So and like I said, I've had some of the, you know, because with crowd, you know, crowd cow and proud cow, you can pick the farms and some of the farms, they are hundred percent Wagyu, but they're domestic raised. So they're not treated the same as the A5 and the A4, but it's definitely, you can, you get one of those steaks. You can definitely tell it's above prime. That's for sure. So crowd cow has been really good to me. Uh, they've sent me some free stuff and I've tried, I like it. And they, they have a farm that's not too far from me. I've been thinking of contacting them, but and driving up to see them, but, uh, I don't know if they would sell straight to me or not. I mean, I might as well go through crowd cow, but, uh, crowd cows. Yeah. yeah. But all those places you've mentioned that, you know, Porter road, uh, snake river farms, all their products have, that I've tried have all been really good quality. They have to be, to be able to resell to people, you know, people reorder because they can't see it. You know, you're looking at it online. You're seeing a picture of it. You're not going to your local butcher shop or your, you know, supermarket. So when somebody gets it in, in order for you to reorder from these guys, you get, they have to go give you a good product. And I haven't had a bad product out of any of them. I've ordered from all three of those that we named. So, and they're all great. So, all right, so let's talk about uh, gra grass-fed versus grain-fed because that's another big, I, I don't know, people tend to get on these uh, buzzwords, you know, grass-fed being, oh, that's the most healthy, that's the best for you. Um, it's kind of like, you know, organic and gluten-free and, you know, all, this, all these other buzzwords that are out <laughs> there. Um, personally, I used to order grass-fed beef um, because my wife got it hooked up through one of her friends and we ordered it a couple of times through a farm out of Tennessee and I was never happy with it because it tastes kind of gamey and there's not a lot of fat on it. Um, so it was always kind of tougher than what I was. It 100%. It was 100%. It was 100% grass fed. And um, so I was never really happy with it, but people get locked into these, these buzzwords. They think, you know, grain fed has been, you know, demonized. Like when people say grain fed, they think of these, commercialized farms where they're just, you know, all, you know, the cows are all stuck in their, you know, one spot and they're just force feeding them, you know, all kinds of fatty stuff to make them fat. And 
that's not usually the case anymore. Most of the stuff that I get and what you can get from crowd cow is all grass fed and grain finished. And that's what I'm, the cow I'm actually getting now is they, they're grass fed when they're out on the pasture, you know, most of their life, but the last three or four months, they start giving them supplemental grains to fatten them up. So what are you guys thoughts on that? Well, they're all every, every animal you buy, every, steer cow whatever is, has, is grass fed that's for sure so there are places that take advantage of that and say grass fed but they don't say 100 percent grass fed so there are people that are kind of doing some shady marketing practices because every they're all grass fed at some point you can't feed them grain their whole life um the one of the things with uh grain finished is that cows are ruminant animals and they're not made to eat grain they're made to eat grass so when we feed them grain to finish them and fatten them up, uh, you have to put antibiotics in there because the grain irritates their rumen. And the rumen gets irritated and it'll get infected. And that infection will go to their liver and kill the animal. So you have to have a constant, steady supply of antibiotics in that feed to keep the rumen from getting infected. Uh, and that's where that E. coli, the, the, you know the E. coli you hear about that it's associated with ground beef and that sort of stuff? That originated in the CAFOs, which the CAFO, C-A-F-O, is a concentrated animal feeding operation. And that's where most of the cattle you buy are finished for grain. They're, they're pasture raised at the ranch, and then they're shipped off to the CAFO, and they're finished there, and then they go to slaughter. Uh, but since there's so much antibiotics, we're using 80% of all the antibiotics we use in this country go to our, uh, our farm animals, go to our you know, livestock. Well, and yeah, I mean, green finished. I, 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 green finished is, uh, yeah, and I think that's, it's kind of like, like I said, you know, when people hear grain fed, they, that's what they picture. They picture these big, you know, farms with the cows just being stuffed grain, you know, their whole lives and, and then slaughtering them up. And, and it, it's not really the case that they're fed it for a certain amount of time to fatten them up. And most of the times, like I said, they're, they're taken care of. I, I just never could get a handle on the gr just the grass only grass fed only because it just was never tasty to me it always had that kind of gamey taste like you get with imported lamb and it was tougher it didn't have much fat to it and um you know even, you know, even the farm we bought it from they had sent you special instructions on how to cook the roasts and stuff so you didn't dry them out and all that <laughs> because you know, they knew it cooked different than than regular um the regular you know stuff you buy in the store so well i would disagree a little bit darren because in the northwest we've got a company called painted hills farms so they have natural beef that are basically grass-fed and then grain finished they also have 100 percent grass-fed beef no hormones nothing that tastes pretty damn good that being said though i've had some grass-fed beef that are horrible yes yeah disgusting you wasted your money so it's hit and miss i think depending on the farm and and what they're eating on the on the on the farm well it could also it could also go back to the breed as well i mean maybe some breeds like yes. maybe if it's across wagyu you know since it naturally the dna of that particular cow has a little bit more marbling to it yes. automatically and a different kinds of fat that it may be better for that one to be a hundred percent grass fed instead of, you know, a hundred percent heifer or, a, you know, a, right. a, just a black, black Angus. Angus, you know? So, I mean, well, I've had grass fed with good marbling. It tastes like crap. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it has to do with the farm, maybe the weather, what type of grass they're eating. What kind of, yeah. I think it's hit and miss. You gotta be really careful. Right. So I guess what I'm trying to get at in these first couple is that all these bud buzzwords that are people kind of look at, and, and hear and, and don't really know what they mean. So get, going back to the, you know, the grading system of prime choice and select and then Wagyu and, and is it 100% Wagyu? Is it cross? Is it A5? Is it Japanese? Is it, uh, you know, grain fed, grass fed, uh, grain finished, grass fed, all these things that people, you know, confuse people. So, I mean, I, I always, try to look as deep as I can into things. So I think bringing these up to the surface and, and letting people understand that, you know, they're not the only ones that are seeing all these things and be, being confused. That's for sure. Uh, by the way, you guys heard of, heard of, or tried that carrot fed beef out in California? No, never heard of it. 
Yeah, there's wow. a, there's a company. I'll I'll send you a link that they feed these. They're they're kind of relatively new. Uh, they've been doing it maybe a couple of years, I think. I'm not positive, but uh, yeah, they're feeding the 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 animals like a carrot diet. Like they're eating a lot of carrots. So a lot of beta be carotene. Oh, I guess. I know that a lot of some of the, you know, the 100% grass fed can get that yellow tinge to it because of the, um, the you know, the difference. Beta carotene. Yeah, you know, the beta carotene from the, just the grass. And then there's a lot more beta carotene in carrots. So I'm sure it'd be a lot, yep. um, you know, it'd be really, uh, I'm interested to see that. So, so I want to get into the cuts now. We can kind of move on. I mean, those, those buzzwords and, you know, with the grading and the types of cows and the, you know, the, type of feed and all that you know people are going to have to decide on their own what they like and, and, and go down that rabbit hole but i want to go into the cuts and i've got a um chart i want to pull up that i use a lot that i send people to it's the uh i'm sharing the screen kevin so that you know it's just uh it's got the different uh, cuts retail you know cuts that you would normally see um, in a s supermarket and it also has a um, there's another oh. chart that goes into commercial type cuts that maybe a butcher shop or a restaurant would buy so can you send that to me oh darren can you send that it's to actually me it's right it's, it's right on the uh, the uh, the beef council's uh, website if you go to the beef, beef council, council. Yeah, all right i'll beef. take a look at it and they've got both of them and they're, they're right on there in the front page oh, okay it Didn't breaks it all down if you can you know see that at the top it kind of shows you the different sections i do of the uh of the steer and this is each half you know has has these so you know most people don't know that you know when most of your cuts on the on a steer you have two sides you know they have you know two sides of it there's only certain things that they only have one of like a hanger steak and um but um everything else though you know you have it on both sides so you got the you know the different sections your chuck section everybody's kind of familiar with chuck roasts and and that but me and you know Kevin and I have talked about this before. The different cuts that are within the chuck when you start breaking that chuck section down, which they were only really started doing that, you know, this seam butchering in the last ten years or so, where you can get some of these steaks. Like I talked about this with the CEO of uh, Porter Road, like the the steaks, like the uh, Denver steaks and the um, Flatiron steaks. You know, they only started really serving those in restaurants in the last within the last 10 or 12 years before More that iron yeah the flat iron they would um, normally just toss it into you know for ground or it would be part of the chuck and they would cut it all into chuck roast so a lot of these terrace sections, major yeah the terrace, terrace major, major is oh. also part of the chuck section now the um there's a lot of these um you know when they start seam butchering these big primals now that they've started pulling these parts out like the denver steak and, and the chuck eye roast like you were talking about earlier uh kevin when we were talking um you know these pieces that people don't know about so i highly recommend you go to this uh chart and just go to uh it's the beef council's main website and they've got these charts up there um you, you a lot of these you won't see at your local um supermarket and you can go to the butcher you know probably there and ask them for it because what a lot of people don't understand now is that there's this thing about 20 years ago or so they, they started doing with beef is instead of shipping, you know, the carcasses and having them butchered, you know, by the, by the, uh, you know, local processors, they would process them all in this one, one area and then put it all on a big box. And then you would buy just like the subprimals. Uh, the, so the butchers will, won't buy like, half a half a steer anymore they buy just boxes of you know like prime rib primals or the chuck you know shoulder or um you know just the, the certain sections and then kind of space it out and cut it out from there so a lot of these That's why butchery is a dying art i mean people yeah. are meat cutters now they're not they're not butchers well okay. butchers, butchery takes a lot of a lot of skill yeah so but in the last few years though i've seen more and more specialty you know seam butchers coming and you can go on youtube and, and watch some of these guys that will actually break down a whole half of a steer and and break it down just by using a knife and show you all these different pieces that you would never have thought were in in a in the half of a steer you know and, and show you just by cutting it from the, 
where the muscles groups, you know, attach, you know, that's what they call it seam butchery. It's the seam where the muscles attach to each other and they just pull these pieces out. It's amazing to me. Um, I've, I've watched a few of those where you can see them pull the tri-tip out, you know, for instance, because the tri-tip is something I'm on the East coast. And I think, uh, you know, Kevin, you're on the East coast. We don't see tri-tips much here unless we're actually it's everywhere. Yeah. On your coast, the on the West, on the West, you know, in California and, and the West coast, it's all over the place, but it's starting to come become a lot more popular over here, but we still, you got to search for it to get a tri-tip. But the you guys had the coulette and the picanha. We don't have that out here. Well, it, because we have a lot of South American, I do in Florida mm -hmm. anyway, there's a lot of Latins and that's a big yeah. cut in Brazil and, and some of the other um, yes. South American countries. So that's actually just part of your, your top sirloin. It's the top section of your top sirloin. And then your tri-tip is actually a, a, a piece, a separate muscle that's attached to the top sirloin and it sits up against the sirloin tip and the top sirloin and it just kind of sits right, right in between and they got to actually work to pull that out of there. You know, so a lot of times that gets ground up into ground beef because the butchers or you know, the processors don't want to take the time to pull that thing out. They'll just cut the top sirloin out and then throw the rest of, you know, the rest of it into um, trim to grind it up. So there's a lot more, once you start looking at some of these charts, I'm going to go back to the other one, because this is the, re the retail one. What you'd normally see at a retail butcher shop nowadays, and then you see there's a, a lot of different cuts in there that you don't normally see in your local supermarket, <clears throat> for sure. When well, I, I have the, there's, there's a local farm uh, that sells at the farmer's market every Saturday here. Uh, they, have, they raise beef. And I talked to this guy like last summer and I was like, where do you get this stuff butchered? He told me, I'm like, is it us? He's like, Oh yeah, this guy's really, I'm like, how good is he? He's like, Oh, this guy's really good. I'm like, well, <coughs> you're, excuse me, you're missing. Like, have you ever heard of this and this? And he had never heard of it. So this guy who's butchering his animals is giving him Delmonico's New York strips, flank steak, all the basic stuff. But, you know, probably throwing the rest of the stuff in the, it's all ground beef. You right. know, and there, there are a lot of value, value added cuts that he's missing out on. So he's selling ground beef for four bucks a pound when he could be selling, you know, the hanger steak or, you know, the picanha or some of these other, you know, for 12 bucks a pound. Yeah. And that's one of the he things I'm a good butcher. I just, um, you know, since I ordered this, this steer from a friend of mine, the processor, he's never used this processor before and he's kind of an old timey guy. And I, I pretty much had to ask him, you know, can you pull these out? Can you pull the tri-tips out? Do you know where they are? Because I went to a butcher shop that a guy's been a butcher for 20 years a couple of weeks ago. And I asked him for a tri-tip and I didn't look to see what he'd put in the wrap. He wrapped it up and just brought it to me. And I just assumed he knew what a tri-tip was. I got it home and it was picanha because it looks like oh a triangle. God. So he thought it was tri-tip and that's what he's been calling tri-tip and that's what he calls tri-tip in his butcher shop. But it's, you know, and I did a video on my YouTube channel about that because people do, they'll, they'll see it cause it looks like a tri triangle cause it's the top of the sirloin, uh, top sirloin. They call it tri-tip <laughs> and it's not, <laughs> you know, there's a totally different uh, piece that's the tri-tip. So a lot of times the, butch from? the butchers don't know what they're doing because they don't take the time. And like I said, you know, it takes them more time to pull these um, sections out and they're not going to bother with that if it's, you know, boxed beef because there are most of the stuff's already pre-cut for them. They're just kind of finishing it off and trimming it a little bit more, cutting it into the, you know, steak sizes, you know, they'll get the primal, the rib primal, you know, like you can go to Costco or Sam's club and you get the rib primal where bone in or bone out is pretty much your choice. And then you just cut it into steaks. That's kind of what they're getting. They're getting it just like that in that cryo pack. And all they're doing is, like you said before, Kevin, is they're cutting them into steaks. That's all they're doing. They're not butchering. They're just steak cutters, you know. Just tell them how, how, how big you want it, and that's it. Like Kevin said, it's a lost art. Yeah. yeah. And if you go on YouTube and you watch some of these guys, you know, where they just have a knife and they're just they're butchering this, you know, uh, you know, half of a steer and just pulling it apart by, by, the, by the separate um, 
sections, you know, where the, uh, you know, where the muscles meet and they're pulling these sections out. It just amazes me. So you got, you know, everybody knows what a filet tenderloin is. Denver steak comes from the chuck. Flat iron steak comes from the chuck. These are certain, every cut of this is certain muscle groups or parts of muscle groups. <clears throat> the hanger steak comes from the diaphragm. There's only one of those. That's one of the things we talk about. There's only one of those per um, steer because it's, it's, sits in the diaphragm and it's a muscle that gets worked a lot. So it's really tasty and very, uh, very flavorful. Um, the, you know, everybody knows what a T-bone or porterhouse is. It's part of the filet and part of the New York strip. strip. Um, I, this here is the uh, food service one now. And this is like what the, you know, like a restaurant would order or even what the uh, butcher could order like in the box beef, but where you can get, you know, like the chuck roll section, like the whole um, shoulder clod, you know, or... Um, Good for barbecue. Yeah. <clears throat> like here, yeah, the shoulder clod here, it's got... And that's where you'll find, like, you know, your flat iron steaks and stuff are part deep into the shoulder clod, which is a group of muscles. It's not just one muscle. It's like a group of different muscles. So your terrace major is a part of that as well. <laughs> Love terrace major. So, Although they call it different things, and, and depending on the butcher you go to, I've petite tender, bistro filet, right. um, yeah, a lot of names. <clears throat> so this is just showing you, like I said, the uh, what a restaurant could order or butcher shop. This is the bigger cuts. You know, different. You know, different cuts. You know, they can also order the tri tips and stuff like that. But um, the knuckle, which is you know a part of the round that they use mostly for like roast beef and stuff like that. The steamship round. I don't know if you guys have ever been to a buffet, you know, like in a higher country club or even on a cruise ship, they'll, they'll usually take a steamship round, which is that thigh muscle and it's, they keep it in one big chunk and they cook it up and into a roast beef and they'll do a carving station with it. Cause it looks so, you know, it's just one big hunk of massive beef that they use. So those are, they were uh, the bane of, the bane of my existence when I was cooking at the Boca Raton Resort and Club because we had to we did a bunch of those and they're, they're about eighty five pounds a piece, yeah. and hauling those out of hot ovens it's a real pain in the butt. And they're usually kind of tough, so you got to cut them really thin. It's kind of like um, uh, like a top round, you know, because it is from part of the round, so it's like that you know the London broil or top round. You got to cut them kind of thin, you know, unless you cook them sous vide or some other way, some other way you tenderize them, but. Um, pretty much a whole steer leg yeah that's that's pretty much yeah it's a whole back leg pretty much so i'm gonna go ahead and get out of this so let's um you know the the we talked about the tri-tip and the chuck you know chuck roast you know the chuck roll itself can, can uh, contains a lot of different um steaks that they can pull out of there what's your favorite steak in the whole cow let's go with kevin since we can't see him oh boy that's pretty tough. I mean, it, it depends what I'm in the mood for. Sometimes I enjoy a filet mignon, you know, I, you know, and everyone says they don't have that much flavor and that's kind of true. They're not as beefy as, you know, other cuts, but sometimes they have their spot and they're really enjoyable. Uh, but in general, I'm probably going to go with a Delmonico. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's basically well, well, it. Uh, New York strips kind of... have more flavor, but they're tough. I meant, I meant, I meant a, a ribeye steak. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now I like, I'm, I'm like a lot of people. I will, I like a ribeye steak and I, I usually like, I don't care to have a bone in. I don't think it adds any flavor to the steak at all. And people will argue about s silly things like that. Um, I think, you know, it can help protect a side of it if you're cooking it, you know, hot and fast or something, but I like boneless ribeye just as well as anybody else. But I tell you what, since I started doing sous vide, I really like top sirloin. I can actually, it, it, to me, it has a lot more flavor. Um, I don't know if it's because it's a work, more of a working muscle, um, kind of like the hanger steak where, you know, and like the picanha, it, it actually has more flavor to it. And I can make it nice and tender using sous vide. And a lot of the stuff that normally would be tough, like a chuck roast, I like chuck roast just as well as a ribeye because I can use sous vide to make it just as tender. And it has just as much marbling in it. And then, you know, some of that connect connective tissue and it starts to break down. It's pretty flavorful too. Now that I think about it, I, I want to change my answer. Outside skirt steak is my favorite. 
I'll take oh, outside wow. skirt steak over anything any day. Yeah, I like skirt steak now, outside, and flank steak too. Yeah, yeah. Flank's great. They both do well with marinades because they're thin, uh, and they have a lot of surface area because they have very big texture. There's a lot of uh, fibrous. You know, you can see the fibers really d- well defined in both of them. Uh, outside skirt steak is is great. It has more now. Inside skirt's good, but it's not nearly as good as outside. The outside has better marbling. It's just it's a better steak all around. And I've done the outside skirts sous vide and you don't have to cut them. If I just grill one, I, I cut it against the grain because uh, it can be a little chewy otherwise. But when I do them sous vide, I don't have to cut them against the grain. I can cut them with the grain and eat them and they're, they're perfectly tender and wonderful. Yeah. And all these, I like, and like tri-tip. I love tri-tip as well. Oh. And, you know, oh, yeah. and I, I talked to, I can't remember who I talked to. I think it was probably the guy from Porter road, but, you know, some of these normally tough, if you cook them traditionally, um, they taste more beefy, even though they may, may not be as marbled as like a ribeye or, uh, you know, other parts or the, even the chuck, but they, since they, they're harder working muscles, they get more blood flow into them and it just takes more beefy. So you being able to use sous vide to make them a lot more tender and then finishing them off and still being medium rare, they just taste you know totally different you know what's your time it's time for a top yeah. sirloin darren by chance what what is it i'm curious i normally do like uh 132 for uh six to eight hours on that kind of nuts. that's that's what i do i go like yeah. six to eight depending on what i'm looking at how thick it is may go a little longer you know i found you know my wife her, her favorite cut is london broil or top round well, however you guys want to call it i call it you know the the supermarkets will label top round London broil all the time. And people will in the, will have fits in the Facebook groups when you call it London broil, because it's that's a cooking method, but you know, top round is one, one of my wife's favorite because she doesn't like fat and I can cook that sous vide and make it super tender. And she loves it. So it'll go about, love about 11 hours with that. Oh, I know. I go, I go 24 to 36 on that. Really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's Cause she likes it. Like, right. it'll top be like a, tough. Yeah, it's it'll go like a fillet. With, I, guess, you know. I guess how thick are you buying? Like the, the two inch steak or something like that. The, yeah, the, 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 they're actually okay, the top yeah. round roasts. So, yeah. Okay, but um, but yeah, she loves that stuff because it comes out to like a fillet to her, and she loves it. So and it's and I it's love only, it for beef jerky. That's only two two dollars and forty cents a pound, so she loves it for that. All right, let's so let's go into since we're talking about cooking methods, let's go into some cooking methods and um, how people can make a better steak. And one of the things I want to talk about is dry brining, marinades, uh, mm. all that kind of stuff. Um, what is dry, dry brining? Because I know people also will argue about this because there's no such thing as dry brining because brining means putting it in liquid. Well, over time, terms change. Uh, dry brining came in in the, in the 1980s. You know, so yes, it's an actual term. People need to get with the program. I'm sorry, dry brining. Put salt on a meat, okay? Uh, I, I get annoyed at people that say, oh, brining only means water and salt. No, it does not. The term changed back in the 80s. Get get, get modern. But um, for me, I dry, I dry brine every piece of meat from, from lamb, chicken to beef. I do it all. So with salt, uh, I'm just salt. I'm pretty precise. So. My personal favorite for steak is 0.60%. Kevin likes about 1% to 1.5% salt. Um, am I right, Kevin? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a salt guy. You're a salt guy, yeah. And I'm a little less salt. But dry brining is awesome. And would your viewers like to know why we salt our steaks? I think they do, but like it's I, I don't measure I'll mine. I just, I just dump mine off. Uh, well, I'll do that with rubs, but the reason why we dry brine our proteins uh, for several reasons, flavor, right? Uh, salt gets inside the meat, it creates a surface brine, water, moisture, gets reabsorbed, it denatures the protein strands, means it loosens them up a little bit, so during the cooking process, they won't squeeze as hard, so you get to retain more moisture after the cook, and damn, it's just good. Uh, the argument about, you know, uh, naked not naked inside a bag and stuff like that i think people that like naked steaks you know steak in a bag sous vide knock yourself out i prefer mine with uh, some salt yeah i definitely a lot of people say this 
a lot of people say the salt also, you know, when you brine, dry brine something, will make it more, make the meat more tender. I don't know if that's true. Uh, I would imagine if it's retaining more moisture, it's going to be more tender because water doesn't have a lot of resistance. So I, I would say, Kevin, that, you know, when they say it's more tender, it's because, um, and I'm not, I'm not a food scientist, is that the uh, protein strands loosen up a little bit, which maybe gives the perception that it's more tender. Yeah, I mean, I mean it might be. I just, I've never tested it, you know? <laughs> I yeah. Mean, I don't well, use, I, I, I haven't done a dry brine against a non-dry brine steak. And I'll probably I have, have to do that sometime soon. I have. Well, I know. Tender. I know like with, um, when you use the other, um, the nitrites and nitrates, they, that does do some kind of tenderization. I don't think it's anywhere near what you can get when you use sous vide or, or um, other marinades, you know, that have, you know, acid in them and, or the other uh, chemicals like, you know, uh, the stuff that pineapple and um, other stuff like that. Oh, has. Yeah, it doesn't have, it's not that kind of tenderization but there, there is some kind of tenderization it does um, one of the things that i know and that, that you can prove this by one of um, the articles on amazing ribs that dr blonder did is that sous vide cooking or what how he put it i think he did this before sous vide was actually popular popular is low temperature cooking actually speeds up the brining process so if you do salt your steaks before you put them in a CV bag and, and cook them, the, it's going to actually speed up the, the, the brining process because the heat agitates the salt particles and actually makes them flow more into the meat. And he actually did some uh, tests on that where he, you know, put di Diana in it. So it actually, you know, I, so what I end up doing now is I don't pre dry brine my steaks if I'm going to cook them sous vide. Um, unless they're really super thick or if it's a really big roast, I will. But if it's just like a one and a half inch or one inch steak, I won't even pre brine it. I'll just put the salt, put it in the bag. Well, and it, it actually speeds up the brining process. So I tested that theory, by the way. And, and yes, Dr. Blonder is correct. It does penetrate during the cook. However, um, and I did like four or five steaks from, you know, 12 hours. Well, uh, salt in a bag six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, up to 40 hours. And I got to tell you, although this, the salt does penetrate during the cook, there's a benefit for waiting at least 12 to 24 hours. It's better, in yes. my opinion, and my guess. Does it go deeper? Does it go... Yeah, so, 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 so in other words, if you have a one inch, one and a half inch steak, you dry brine for 24 hours. It might have went in, let's say, a quarter of an inch on both sides. During the cooking process, it probably went into the center. Whereas what you're doing, you're throwing salt in the bag, in the bag, souffling it, and yes, you're getting deeper penetration, but not to the very, very center. So there is a benefit to dry brining it at least 12 to 24 hours. Gotcha. If you got the time. I mean, hmm. unless it's side by side, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. Right. At all. You're not. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's another thing if it's convenience and a lot of the convenience factors, yeah. you know, I'm big on that too, because do I want to, you know, I'm already with sous vide, you're, you have to have that uh, time that you got to adjust for, you know, longer cooking times. So do you want to add on top of that another day or so for, uh, for dry brining? So Kept let's see te technique, technique. Yeah. So let's talk about the different cooking methods. So you got hot and fast, you got pre sear, you got reverse sear, um, constant flipping, all these different types, you know, and everybody seems to, and one of the things I hate, especially on the internet groups is people seem to try to put different cooking methods against each other. You know, like what's the best one. I want the best cooking method, you know, that's you why go, is, is sous vide the best or is reverse sear the best or is the, you know, cooking it, you know, constant flipping the best. And, you know, so <laughs> what do you I guys think? think the best about is whatever you like, whatever. I think if I was going to define what the best is, it's whatever you like. Yeah. Whatever you like is the best. They all have their merits. And yeah. you know what? A lot of people they like, do. like, like hanging out by a grill and cooking their straight steak a hundred percent on the grill. It's fun to hang out by a grill and drink some beer and talk to friends with sous vide. You, you, you're spending it just a few minutes at the grill. Cause you have the steak already cooked. You're just putting a sear on it. You don't get to spend half an hour cooking steaks with buddies. 
Yeah. Now I do think there are some benefits and some, you know, end results that can be different from the different cooking methods. And that, that comes down to what you personally like or just don't like, you know, do you like your steaks more tender? You might want to do sous vide and then sear. Do you want, you know, more of a, a crust, you know, uh, you know, you might want to do the hot and fast, you know, do you like it a little tougher? You know, you like that, you know, steak bite, um, you know, then, you know, reverse sear might be for you. So it's all going to boil down the personal preference. They all work. They all do their job. They all produce similar results. Some of them are, you know, slightly different, but I'm with you guys. I mean, you got to pretty much, I don't think cooking methods aren't out to get each other. They're just cooking methods. And I like to cook things, you know, multiple different ways and, and enjoy all of it. I cook fried chicken. I cook, you know, barbecue chicken, I cook roasted chicken and, and I enjoy them all. I don't sit there and pit those cooking methods against each other, which is better fried chicken or roasted chicken. Well, they're both great. I like them both. Yes, they are. So, so why would you sit there and do that with a steak? You know, is it reverse sear better than I, the. I love a sous vide burger because I can eat a medium rare burger safely uh, and I like a medium rare burger, but I also really enjoy a smash burger every once in a while. So it depends on what mood I'm in and a smash burger is well done and it's super crispy and thin. It's a totally different eating experience, but I enjoy them both. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, one thing I want to talk about, and this one I can't get over because I, I, I've had the president of the State uh, Cook-Off Association on my show, and I've talked to some people that are in these competitions, the cooking-type competitions. And one of the things I can't understand is why some of their judging um, you know, guidelines that they use, they, why they use certain things, and like with the state cook-offs, and, and, and when they do this and people who are not knowledgeable and they watch these shows where they see these competitors cooking, that's where I think some of this comes into, well, I saw this guy, he wins all these competitions doing it this certain way. So that's gotta be the best way. And like with the state where I'm getting it is a state cook off competitions. If you don't have the grill marks, you know, the diamond hatch pattern grill marks on your steak, more than likely you won't win because that's one of the, things they look at as the judges um, Sorry, criteria. But, yeah. But to me, it's a waste because you lose out on the Maillard reaction on that whole steak, which can take away from the flavor. So what do you, what are your guys thoughts on that? I know that a lot of people say, well, you eat with your eyes first, which is true to some extent, but you know, sometimes, you know, that can, if it's taken away from your overall, the way the steak tastes <laughs> to me, it's not worth it. But uh the pattern's pretty, and where you're eating at the pattern tastes good, but I'm a, I am like constant flipping. I want the Maillard all over the steak, uh, better flavor. So if you go to, like constant if you go to these great, you know, these well-known steakhouses like Peter Luger's and stuff, they're putting those steaks under a broiler that's 1,800 degrees. Um, you're not, they're not going for grill marks. They're going for the Maillard reaction and a crust on that steak. They don't want it. They, they want it to taste good. They don't care about how pretty the grill marks look. I mean, grill marks are great, but you're not getting as much flavor as you are if you're getting the Meyer, you know, the Meyer reaction completely across it. And what, at the end of the day, it comes down to flavor. I'm not in a comp, I'm not a competition circuit co steak cooker, so I don't bother with that grill mark stuff. Yeah, and I think that's where, like I said, back when um, you know the. Um, the, the barbecue cooking shows were big on the food food channel <clears throat> and people still today, I see them in some of the barbecue groups. They think that the competition cooking is what the level of, Oh, that's, that's the best way to cook something because they cook, they saw Johnny Triggs, you know, on one of the barbecue cook off shows dumped honey and agave and brown sugar and parquet and stuff on his ribs, that that's the way you need to cook them to make them good. But, you know, even, well, it's the, like, even the barbecue guys will tell you that they only do that for the one bite, you know, to get somebody's attention. But with the steak cook-offs, it's, they're, they're trying to make it look a certain way. And I've seen them now, now what they do is they, they tie them up the ribeye. I'll take a ribeye, a boneless ribeye, and they'll make it, try to make it round. So it doesn't even look like a ribeye to me anymore. It looks more like a top round <laughs> or a top steak, you know, the top sirloin, and then they make sure they get the grill marks on it. So it, it's, so much of it is based on 
a certain appearance just to win that particular steak cook-off. It's not even, doesn't even look appealing to me because it doesn't even look like a, raw, a ribeye steak anymore. Like I said, it's more of, you're, you're not shooting for overall, is that a good steak? It's more of, does it fit into these criteria that, that are on this sheet? But hey, that's, that's them. That's what they do. People love to do those things. And, you know, if somebody loves to do something and have fun with it, that's fine. But what I don't like is when people that are not familiar with those or don't do it, they put that as that should be, you know, what the best of this is. That's what, you know, competition barbecue is what, you know, the best ribs are. And it's like, no, not really. <laughs> you would never, never want to eat a rack of whole rack of competition barbecue ribs. Right. Well, and by the way, I see some of these steak cook, I, I probably wouldn't want to eat their steaks either because, <laughs> you know, they probably they look pretty, but, uh, you know, I don't want to, just because it's got cross hack, you know, on it and it's, you know, shaped like a, you know, round softball, you know, that it doesn't, it's not appealing to me. So, but. Um, Did you guys want to touch on the names of cuts and how they're different from state to state, butcher to butcher? Sure. Go ahead. Since um, you brought that up, I'll let you run well, it. And the reason why I bring it up is I'm Jewish. If you viewers don't already know that, kosher dosher. And although I don't eat kashrut, meaning specifically uh, rabbinically certified kosher meat, I've noticed my friends in New York City, uh, from street corner to street corner, there's different butchers, kosher butchers. And each butcher will have a, a funky name for a cut of meat. You look at it and go, well, that's a chuck roast. That's something else. They call it all different names. And uh, there's a, a group on Facebook called, I think, uh, What Kosher Cut Is It Really? And there's a guy on there named Bosch. Bosch is a great guy. And, and people, I'm looking at it right now. It's called the uh, Imitation Cheek Meat. And I'm looking at it like, what the hell is that? So you have guys that know a lot about meat. You put a photograph up and say, hey, what cut is that? And, and so I find that very unusual in the Jewish community. But also, you talk about the New York Strip, you got the Kansas City Strip, the New York Strip, and in New York City, where I grew up, they called it the club. They didn't call it a strip, they didn't call it a New York, they called it a, a club. Yeah. So, uh, I just find it, except for the ribeye is a ribeye, but well, everything else has a different freaking name. Yeah, some of them, like with the Kansas City, that's just a New York strip with the bone on it, pretty much. So, And they call it the club in New York. Yeah. They call it the club. Because of the bone, you can hold it like a club. Now, what I get confused is, especially since, you know, we're in these Facebook groups and you get people from all over the world in there, you get somebody from England or somebody from Australia or Canada, and they call, you know, ribeye something totally different. They'll call it a, oh. you know, you know, and you're like, I don't know what that is, you know, <laughs> but then and they ask you like, you're, you're supposed to know, Hey, what's this joint, you know, this or that. And it's like, I don't know. So you got to go look up these other charts, but that, that's or see, a, pi see it, a picture. Yeah. So yeah. If you look interestingly up, enough, a, a, a while ago that, I mean, I don't know how long ago, uh, someone decided, Hey, we need to standardize this stuff. And so they created the meat buyer's guide which actually does standardize all the American cuts. Uh, you know, you can say, I want a 106, which is uh, ribeye, roast, blah, blah, blah. You know, I want a 106A, which is a little different. There are variations. I don't know if you guys have looked through the meat buyer's guide. You can look, you can look it up online uh, and look at it for, you can look at it for free. You don't have to buy the book. The book's pretty expensive. But there is a resource out there in this country that standardizes everything. Uh, but it doesn't mean that, somebody can't call it whatever they want, you know, like the bistro tenderloin from, for a terrorist major. Uh, yeah. And fish is the same way. You know, I mean, there's so many different names for the same fish and well, people and mislabel like, fish. And that's and, and like get, getting back to the top round being labeled London broil in, in the supermarkets, you know, they, they, they label it that. And then people automatically think that that's a cut and it's really not. But also prime rib. People will say, "Ooh, prime rib! I got a prime rib." Well, what's 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 the cut prime rib? It's it's just huh. rib, you know. And it's uh, you know, somebody can say that it's between this part and this, you know, this rib and that rib. But that's even up for grabs because if you look it up online, you do a search and you really can't find to where 
anybody really says that you, you could take any rib roast and say that it's you know prime rib you know now if it's more more towards the chuck and it's more like the 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 um chuck eye section you know maybe that's not quite prime rib anymore <laughs> you know but you know yeah you, you get under these different um I don't know, like like you were talking about the Delmonico, you know, it's not really a, a cut that you would, you would find, but I, what you were talking about that, um, those numbers in that book, isn't that mostly for restaurants and, and uh, hotels ordering pretty much like on a wholesale basis, Kevin? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's a, it's a professional uh, book. Yeah. I mean, it's for, yeah, it's for professionals, but you can, anybody can buy it. You can get it on Amazon. Um, but, a lot of times your local butcher though, won't know that because they're not, like we said, when they're not butchering from a, a steer anymore, they're butchering out of a, you know, out of boxed beef. So they're, they're really not familiar with a lot of that stuff anymore. They're just, you know, they're getting the primals, you know, separated already and they're just cutting them into steaks for you. You know, they're not breaking it down. Now you do have some out there that are specializing in doing the, um, you know, like we said, the seam butchery, you know, now, but that's few and far between still. Like I said, I went literally a month ago and got, you know, to a butcher shop that's been there 20 years. And, you know, he told me he was giving me tri-tip. I got it home and it was picanha because, you know, he didn't know what he was doing. So. <laughs> well, at least it wasn't chuck roast. No, no, no. And that's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's things like that. People get can kind of confused, you know, and, um, I don't know. All right, guys, anything else we can talk about steaks? I think we're about out of time. Do you guys want to talk about like the different parts of like even a ribeye, you know, where you've got the, the ribeye, uh, the eye section of the ribeye and then the spinel. The eye and then the, the cap. Oh, yeah. gosh. Because I know yeah, that I that was it. a big thing a while ago. And I think Costco stopped doing it where they were actually just pulled the spinalis off, which is the top muscle that kind of sat on top of that fat you know, cap that sat on top they of the roll it and cut into steaks. Yeah. They would roll it and cut it into the steaks. But I think yep. they stopped doing that because it, uh, they charged, I think it was like almost 20 bucks a pound that they charged for that. Yes, yes they did. 1999 a pound is what I paid. I paid yep, 20 bucks a I pound agree. for them. And that was, yes. Yeah. I think they did. I think they did stop doing them. Uh, I've heard different, like, I'm not seeing them on any of those sous vide groups anymore. So, and Costco was a big place that was doing them. So yeah. I, and I haven't, I haven't been to a Costco and, a year or two so i don't know i haven't seen them in a while and i don't like you said i haven't seen them post people posting about them anymore but and i think what it was is that you know they would pull the spinellus off and try to sell the uh this the the ribeye with just the eye section and people were buying them and being dissatisfied with it because they were still charging a pretty penny for it like they were a full ribeye and so people were kind of getting ticked off you know but again costco blade tenderizes everything also so that's another reason i never buy pre-cut steaks at Costco. I always buy the whole, uh, the primals and cut my own steaks, but, uh, and I never actually had those. So, cause I couldn't see paying $20 a pound for them where I could actually buy the primal and, and cut it myself like that. <laughs> I gotta know? tell you, I've oh, never had a good Costco steak. I, call me a snob. I've never had a good Costco steak, even from the, the prime section. I buy a cryovac and I do okay. Yeah, I buy the I buy them cryovac and then I actually age the uh, the primal yep. before you I do start the same slicing. thing. Yeah, because I'll put them if you two or three weeks, and let's, we can talk about that too. Because you know, with Costco especially, their most of their meat is pretty green, which just means they don't age it at all. They don't do much wet aging at all. When they butcher it, I mean, they they wait for the rigor to go away, and then they slice it up, uh, butcher it, and send it to the stores. So. Just for example, you know, I just ordered, I told you I ordered this cow. I had the, the processor hang it for two weeks to dry age it, you know, before he even cuts it up. Now with Costco, they slaughter it two days later. They slice it up and send it out to the stores. They got no aging time on them. So even if you're buying the, the subprimals or the primal sections, you need to age them uh, because it will just make it more flavorful and, you know, tenderize it some, but, um, yeah, I, I, at least a week or two, the, when I buy a, um, I, I like to buy their, their top sirloin sections and I'll age those for at least uh, two weeks before I cut them up into steaks. What's funny. Uh, you mentioned the jacardine. 
uh, the needling they do. I watched a video on the guy doing the state competition stuff, and he did it just like you said, tied it up, made it round. He also decarded that steak, and he cooked it to medium rare, I think, medium, medium rare. I forget what they go to, they go for. Um, but, yeah, he actually decarded that steak, and I was like, wow, well, that's probably not the safest thing to set, send to your judges, but, you know, it's a competition, so who cares, I guess. Not well, to when, mention, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I don't. If you read the know. fine label on Costco's mechanically tenderized steaks known as Jacardi, it says cooked to 160. 165. It's, yeah, because they know you're not, the, I'm, I'm not saying that the surface pathogens, but if there were surface pathogens, you're injecting it into the interior of the meat. Yeah, so yep. it's like. And of course, if you if you sous vide to pasteurization, you don't have to worry about that. The biggest issue for me on on, on the blade tenderization is not the uh, potential of it, you know, being getting me sick. It's just it's damaging the meat. It's tearing the meat up. <laughs> there's there's other ways you can you can do what they're doing with that that are not going to affect the uh, outcome of the meat. And like I said, I've had. I've jacarded some myself and it's just like, it's like, you know, it, it, it's the texture is just not the same. So, so, all right, guys, I think, we've, I think we've covered just about everything we could talk about steaks, but, um, well, how do you like yours? Medium rare, medium, well done. What's that? Let's talk about that. Oh gosh. Let Kevin talk about his chart that I actually designed. And I think it's spot on. So, Oh, the sevens, the rule oh, the of rule, sevens. This is rule of seven, man. It's freaking outstanding. Yes, it works. Start, so you only have to remember two numbers, 7 and 122. So rare starts at 122. Add 7 to 122, you get 129. So your rare range is 122 to 129. Then you go start at 130. 130, add 7. 130 to 130. I think I'm doing my math right. Anyway, you get the idea. You start at 122, add 7 for rare. Then you get start at 130, add seven. There's your range for medium rare. Keep going on. Then you get medium, well, medium well, and then well done. It makes okay. it super easy. It, is, and it, it makes sense. It works, it, it, it works fine. I mean, it really, no one that's ever tried it that I've talked to has argued with me originally about temperatures. I mean, I know people that define medium rare as 131 to 134. So you have it's a three not. degree variation. And I'm like, that makes no sense. I mean, there's obviously, you know, and like Lloyd did his experiment on can you tell the difference? And he did stakes at like 131, 132, 133, 134, blah, blah, blah. And you can't tell the difference between the color of a steak at 131 nope. and one at 135. Right. Maybe not even 137. Um, so the rule of seven, because everyone, I mean, you'll just see temperature ranges all over the charts. I see people saying a, a rare steak is 108 degrees. Right, like that's yeah. a raw steak. <laughs> exactly. That's a, that's not a rare yeah. steak. There, that's a raw a, steak. There's a big difference between raw and uh, rare. That's for sure. You know, and uh, yeah, and, and I I have no qualms, but people can eat meat any way done this they want. You know, if somebody likes to eat their stuff, well done. I had in laws that you know I used to cringe when I had to cook for them because I had to cook theirs. You know, well done and make sure. There was absolutely no red in it at all, so there was no juice in it. But you know, that's the way they like to eat it. I mean, it, you know, I love the fact that there is, especially with CV, you have that range though, and um, you know, with the time and the temp, where now you just don't have just that temperature of what's medium rare. You can actually make something that's normally tough and medium rare and make it uh, tender uh, by using the CV method as well. So. Um, an interesting observation I've made with people who eat their steak well done is if you meet their parents, their parents eat their steak well done. Right. So that's what they grew up with. That's why they like it. No one grew up eating. I don't know anyone or ever heard of anyone growing up with parents who cooked their meat and they were served meat medium rare. And all of a sudden they switched their mind and decided they like it well done. Right. And it comes, uh, it comes from a cultural thing, you know, so. Yeah, right, most guys. of the world eats their steak, eats their meat well done. Yeah. The vast majority of the world eats their meat well done. Well, and a lot of it is because, you know, there used to be, you know, a lot bigger percentage of you being able to get sick if you didn't cook it all the way because it was either, Absolutely. you know, not refrigerated properly or, um, you know, uh, 
any, any number of issues with it, parasites, anything, you know, I mean, I know that was one of the things with my in-laws is they came from a time where, you know, you could be eating a bad piece of meat. And if you cook the hell out of it, more than likely you could kill any bacteria that were in it. So. Well, thanks. Yes. Uh, thanks it's Thanksgiving, like pork. Right? Well, it's like pork, you know, people still get the trichinosis. Ooh, you can get trichinosis if you eat, you know, undercooked pork. Well, that's pretty much gone anymore. So now you can, you know, but with the, um, with the CD coming on board, you can do a lot of things now that can get rid of that part of it as well. So. So, all right, guys. Well, I want to thank you guys for being on. I'm sure there's more we could have talked about with steak, but I mean, it's a, it's a hot topic. Well, it looks like we lost Kevin, but I want to thank you, Lloyd. Um, I'm sure oh, we'll, he'll thanks, be on Aaron. again. Uh, it was great talking to you guys about steak and I'm sure we'll do this again next month and we'll find something else we can, you know, talk about delve deep into and thanks again lloyd lloyd check out the lloyd's blog the kosher dosher he does a lot of um experiments and fun stuff with sous vide and other things he does not just sous vide he does all kinds of cooking so i got a new one coming up too in the next couple of weeks a new new experiment all right new experiment so always look forward to that but thanks for joining us make sure you follow us on the fire and water cooking youtube channel facebook group and page and see you on the next fire and water cooking podcast thanks guys thanks again for joining us here on the fire and water cooking podcast i want to thank lloyd and kevin again for being on make sure you follow them on the kosher dosher blog and uh, facebook group sous vide food and fun make sure you follow us on the fire and water cooking podcast youtube channel facebook group and page and the website i'll see you on the next fire and water cooking podcast